we were asked earlier this afternoon, what are the prospects of the Congress calling the nation to a solemn assembly? Now that almost sounded absurd. And perhaps most of you don't know that only a relatively short time ago, there was a very serious move in Congress toward that very goal. In fact, I was asked if I would go to Washington and speak to both the Senate and the House at a solemn assembly they were seeking to call. But they failed because one very dominant man with a hatred of everything true and godly was able to squelch that so that we don't really have any hope in the Congress or the Senate. But do you have any hope in yourself? My word, I've been preaching for more than 65 years and have never yet succeeded in bringing a revival to pass. I surely have no hope in myself. I look at the other speakers, men whom I respect and honor and admire, but I don't have any hope in them either. <laughs> I don't have any hope in the church. But I remember well the words of the psalmist, turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. The hope was never in us. It is crystal clear that God calls upon us to repent, and when we can, we must. But when we can't, it's still not too late. Because God can do what we cannot. Oh, we believe that, of course. But I doubt that we believe it to the level that we ought. Now, naturally, in preparation for this conference, I've given substantial time and attention to what I ought to speak upon, and uh, I have been asking regularly the question, what passage of Scripture that really deals with the issues can I call to your attention at this hour? Only one seems suitable, but I said, Lord, I can't use that <laughs> because I already did on another occasion. In fact, I've got some proof before me that I actually did. Listen to this. A revival cry, Psalm 80. Why is thine ear not listening now? Why is thy glory gone? Why is thy power scarcely seen? Why is thy face withdrawn? Why art thou angry with our prayers? Why are we filled with tears? Why do our foes contend and laugh? Why, Lord, these many years, thou in thy grace has planted us, nurtured us by thy care, prospered our lives with wondrous grace, sowed bounteous seed to bear. I'll not read the rest of this fine poem, but at the bottom it reads, Bill Eliff, April 29th. 1993, 
after hearing Richard Owen Roberts preach on this text. <laughs> well, some of you weren't there, so perhaps you can be hopeful, but Bill is sitting here. We are reluctant, aren't we, to repeat ourselves? We try desperately not to. Our minds aren't all that sharp, really. And people who hear us tell us from time to time, I heard you say that before. <laughs> but we haven't seen the revival yet that we need. And so what's wrong with going back to a passage we've looked at before and look at it again with the great hope Turn us again, O oh God, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Let's go directly to Psalm 80. Let me read it in its entirety. As you're turning to it, may I simply state we'll divide the psalm into four parts, verses 1 to 3, the opening petition, verses 4 to 7, the heartfelt lament, verses 14 to 19, the heart of the prayer unveiled. And I left out verses 8 to 13. The contrast between the way it was and the way it is. So, verse 1, O oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, thou who dost lead Joseph like a flock, thou who art enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy power and come to save us. O oh God, restore us and cause thy face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. O oh Lord God of hosts, how long Wilt thou be angry with the prayer of thy people? Thou hast fed them with the bread of tears, and thou hast made them to drink tears in large measure. Thou dost make us an object of contention to our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. O oh, God of hosts, Restore us and cause thy face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. Thou didst remove a vine from Egypt. Thou didst drive out the nations and didst plant it. Thou didst clear the ground before it, and it took deep root and it filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shadow, and the cedars of God with its boughs. It was sending out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why, hast thou broken down its hedges so that all who pass that way pick its fruit? A boar from the forest eats it away. And whatever moves in the field feeds on it. O oh, God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech thee. Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine, even the shoot which thy right hand has planted, and on the son whom thou hast strengthened 
for thyself. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou didst make strong for thyself. Then we shall not turn back from thee. Revive us, and we will call upon thy name. O Lord God of hosts, restore us. Cause thy face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. None of us, when we're in our right minds, think that we can revive ourselves. But in careful, sober, biblical thinking, we face the necessity of doing what we can. Therefore, the exhortations we have been considering already this afternoon drawn out of Second Chronicles 7. But is it not glorious to realize that when we've gone so deeply into sin as a nation, it's still not too late? We might just as well go home now as to spend the rest of this brief conference period together if it's up to us. But thank God, it isn't up to us. Listen, I've been thinking, suppose God himself was willing to add another chapter to Holy Scripture, a chapter written this morning for today. Could he come any closer to the heart of the issue? than we have right here in front of us in Psalm 80. Is not everything we need to consider on this subject of revival in front of us in this passage? It's incredible, really, when you consider how absolutely relevant the Word of God is to every time and every circumstance. Now notice how this particular Psalm begins. O give ear, shepherd of Israel, thou who dost lead Joseph like a flock. When would one ask God to listen? Well, clearly, at the time when there's reason to think he is not doing so. Have you ever asked, why is the prayer meeting vanishing from the church? And in those few places where some remnants of prayer remain, why is it that the bulk of those prayers are focused on passing matters, temporal, earthly things that really have nothing to do with the reign of Christ and the advancement of the kingdom of God. Well, when God's not asking, or when we're asking and God's not listening, then our prayers degenerate to the point where they become what might be called cheap prayers. You gather together as a church in a prayer meeting and you ask God to do something he's already done in creation itself. Oh, please pray for Mary Jones. She fell and broke her arm. Well, before the creation, God intended to make a human body that could heal itself. We haven't accomplished anything of major consequence when we pray for these physical things. Now, obviously, God intended we should pray for those things that are real. 
Not the shadowy things, but the things of substance. Most of us have faced the reality of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith gives substance to things that are hoped for. It provides the evidence of things not seen. We know, but the nature of faith is it enables a person to focus upon the unseen and the eternal. So when Christians come together, that's where the focus ought to be. But when God's not listening to our prayers, then we ask for those cheap, those simple, those inconsequential things that are going to more or less automatically be answered. Now have you faced the reality that we are living at a time when God is by and large not listening. If one were to arrange a list of reasons why revival is so desperately needed, that would surely be one of the reasons. So give ear, shepherd of Israel, thou who dost lead Joseph like a flock. Do you have the impression the church is being led like a flock? All these wild innovations that have appeared over the last several years don't in any way indicate any knowledge of God whatsoever, let alone divine leadership. Because God isn't leading us, we've invented ways to lead ourselves that make it look as if he is. We've created lousy substitutes for the reality of a God who is with us, going before us, leading us like a flock. But look at what he adds uh, to that statement. Notice now these words before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh stir up thy power and come to save us. Oh, but you said you left out something of incredible consequence. Well, yes, I did, didn't I? Thou who art enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. Now again, when would you ask God to shine forth? Would it not be at the time when he was not doing so? But, but consider the very language here. Thou who art enthroned, Above the cherubim. You remember perfectly well that in those days when indeed God was in that tabernacle in the wilderness and then in the temple itself, once a year the great high priest was to go into the Holy of Holies to make sacrifice both for his sins and the sins of the people. And we understand it was a dangerous thing to do because he might, when in that holy place where the presence of God shines so greatly, no man could endure it, they first put in a smudge pot in order to obscure the presence of God. And then before that high priest entered to fulfill his duties, you remember perfectly well, don't you? I, I, I have to hold on because I never know when I'm about to fall over. But uh, they put a cord around his ankle so that if he offended God and was struck down, they didn't have to go in to pull his body out but they could draw his dead body out by a cord. Thou who art enthroned 
above the cherubim shine forth. The psalm is written at the time like this. When God is turning a deaf ear to the prayer of his people. When God is withholding his glory from his people's midst. 